Can you believe what a gorgeous film? Aren't you so glad that you got to see it in a real theater instead of on a television screen? So fantastic. And a lot of that music soundtrack is original music made for this film. Um, I'm so grateful to HBO for letting us screen this. And uh, now I want to introduce our special guests. Diana Winkler, the co-director, straddles the worlds of fiction and documentary. In addition to the United States, she's working on a full-length screenplay called Bell, which she workshopped at Sundance Screenwriters Lab. Variety Magazine just named her one of their top 10 documentary filmmakers to watch. Skater Felicia Wright is an actress, singer, and motivational speaker. Born and raised here in Los Angeles, she's sung and recorded for various artists, including Stevie Wonder's annual House Full of Toys concerts and Grammy-nominated gospel singer Ty Tibbet. Tribbett, sorry. She's been acting in gospel stage plays since she was 12 and has also worked behind the scenes as a producer for A Taste of Soul and the BB Jazz Festival. Ernest Hardy is our moderator tonight. He's a film and uh, his film and music criticism has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, Rolling Stone, The LA Times, and The LA Weekly. And he contributed to the reference books, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die, and classic material, The Hip Hop Album Guide. Ernest has been a juror for the Sundance Film Festival, San Francisco International Film Festival, the Palm Springs International Short Film Festival, LA Outfest Fest, and the LA Film Festival. So please join me in welcoming Diana Winkler, Felicia Wright, and Ernest Hardy. Thank you all for coming out, especially in this weather. And if we could have one more round of applause for Tina Brown, the co-director who isn't here. I have a ton of questions, but one of the first I want to ask is, um, how is Buddy doing now? Hmm. Um, his rink is still closed, uh, but they still own it. And they're fighting hard. They have tried. Uh, the city has tried to rezone it multiple times, and they have said no. Uh, and so they've faced a lot of struggles. They couldn't afford to keep it heated, and so the pipes burst and then ruined the floor. And but they they have big dreams to get it reopened. And um, so we've been working with them actually, and Reggie is working with them as well to create a pilot. A roller rink project where we turn it into a nonprofit, and that way, hopefully, it can stay open and be supported uh, in a different way. So, we're working on that now. How did you become interested in this topic? Always the first question: How did I make this movie? <laughs> um, so, I'm from Hawaii, and Tina, who isn't here tonight, is from Australia, and neither of us have anything to do with this culture uh, at all. And it's very important to us, actually, that stories are told by people from their own communities. And so, when we first were uh, introduced to this world, we felt like it was not our story to tell, and we made a lot of good friends, and. Uh, went home and said, well, I hope somebody makes a film about this because it was pretty special. Uh, but the skaters that we met that night kept reaching out to us and saying, well, when are you coming to the next skate party? And you got to come here and you got to you know, come to this rink and that. And so ultimately what we decided to do was to, to do a little bit of R&D research and development and shooting, um, make a, a very short teaser and screen it at the largest national skate party of the year, which is in Atlanta. And so there were several thousand people there. We screened this teaser uh, that had a couple interviews and some footage. And we basically said at the start, we don't want to make this film unless we make it with you, by you, for you. And if you don't like what we're doing or if you don't want us to be making this, then we're very happy to walk away. Uh, and they watched it, and we had a standing ovation, and people and started cried, screaming. Like, hey, and, and then the floodgates just opened, and, and they were like, you, when you come to Kentucky, you can stay with me. And when you come to... And so Tina and I are very proud to say we never paid for a hotel. We never rented a car. Every city, and we went to a lot of cities, we lived with the skaters, stayed on their couches, on their floors. They took us to their rinks on their nights. And uh, so we never walked into a, a rink from the outside. And how did, how did they win your confidence? Because they, they have a lot of access to your life. What did they do or say to convince you to give them that level of access? 
just be themselves. Yeah. Um, um, really, I'm, I think I'm a pretty good judgment character. And these women came into our lives as if they've been there our entire lives, and they're very authentic women. Um, they're women of their word. And um, that goes a lot, especially in the roller skating community, because we're very tight. As large as we are, we're very tight knit. And um, these young women brought that trailer that night and blew my mind. I was crying like a baby. And it was a white party, so dresses all jacked up and makeup. That means everybody's wearing white. <laughs> we all had on white. And I mean, a lot of us were in tears because someone got the story right, or the beginning of the story right at the time. So we entrusted them to tell the story. And how long did it take you from realizing you wanted to make a film to where we are right now? How long that is that? Was that process too long? It took us uh, five years to from the starting of shooting to premiering at Tribeca, and now we're in our sixth year of being on the road. We were in 125 plus film festivals, and we're still continually promoting the film. Felicia and I were in back-to-back -back interviews with five-minute breaks up until coming here tonight. So we are definitely still working on the film, and. And uh, still for free, but doing it for the love. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, when you watched the final film, was there anything, I mean, this is your community, but was there anything you learned that you didn't know about? Yes, I learned that um, the first sit-in for civil rights was a skate-in. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that people were getting beaten to be able to skate. That's crazy. And to know that skating start at a such vital time in American history, um, that's one of the things I learned, and I was just blown away. The some of the photographs, I especially love the photographs that seem to be from maybe the '40s or so. Um, such dapper, I mean, just amazingly. Um, where did you, you get that those kinds of photographs? It was so hard to find that footage because um, everywhere that we went looking for archival either photographs or image, moving image of that time in history were only of white skaters. And I actually went to, there's a roller skating museum in the US, it's in Nebraska. Um, and I, I went there and the entire museum was just white skating, as if this hadn't existed ever in our, cult in our, in our country. Um, and I tried to find anybody to talk to, but it was empty. Uh, <laughs> I hope they see the film. Uh, but so, yeah, finding that footage was really hard. And then we started finding some of it, and we couldn't figure out who owned it. And then we couldn't license it. And so we went down many rabbit holes. And um, the gentleman that you see who we actually did interview, Reverend Cohen, uh, who we, so we, we knew that rinks were at the epicenter of the civil rights movement and that there was this first sit-in in the roller rink. And we were trying to find anybody who was alive at that time who could tell us the stories and um, you know, we kept going down roads not being able to, to, to reach anyone and we finally did meet Reverend Cohen and um, he's in his 90s and um, had had a stroke and he led us into his home and he had some of those photos framed in his house. So we were able to film the photos in the photographs, I mean in the picture frames um, and then uh, get around some of the licensing but we did license many of the others. As well. <laughs> then I'm going to jump forward and um, that amazing um, vintage footage of early hip hop artists. Um, how did you get that, and where, where was that? Oh where was God. that? Uh, so you're asking all the hardest part of the <laughs> film questions. Um, so the Queen Latifah footage, for example, that we found. Um, they originally, the gentleman who owned it, uh, originally wanted to sell it to us for eight thousand dollars a second. <laughs> um, yeah, and we negotiated down a little bit, but it was still incredibly expensive. And, you know, we kept hearing these stories of, oh, you know, Dre got his start DJing in the rink, and LL Cool J got his start performing in New York, and we heard all these stories, but we couldn't find any of it. And we went into, like, deep into the archives to find this stuff. And, and everywhere we went, people kept laughing and saying, like, none of us had cameras back then. We didn't have that kind of money. We weren't filming it. And so, um, yeah, it was a it was a... A journey, and so ultimately we ended up using that clip from Straight Out of Compton to show some of it because we couldn't find more. One of the um, 
in the film at one point you described yourself as a rink rat. Um, and we see in the film how external forces shape the culture and, and distort and disrupt. But I'm wondering from like a more personal perspective, how has LA skate culture changed since you were a child? Not, not necessarily like the political stuff around it, but just in terms of the aesthetics or you know, what's happening in the, in the rinks. It's so different now because the rinks aren't owned a lot of times by people who care about the culture. It's just about the dollar. It's not about the culture and saving it and the meaning of it to those people who strap up those, lace up those eight wheels weekly and some daily. And um, we just wanted to take, we want that corporate um, stack off of it because it takes the authenticity from it. Um, there are people are even scared of the film doing that, but we're just trying to show you guys that we're still alive and well. Um, and we skate, we travel and skate all the time and we can't skate in the cities that we're from because of them just not, a lot of them not caring anymore. So like I'm leaving on this Friday to go to Houston, Texas to skate to a, to a skate jam to have fun. I, sh I, I used to be able to skate in LA almost every night. We don't have that anymore because we just don't have people, or people feel like skating is dead. No, honey, we're alive and well, and we are here. We're not going nowhere. We'll skate outside if we have to. We're gonna get it in, but it's such a beautiful thing. Like, we don't skate out of town till 12 midnight, and it's over five, six in the morning. That's love, y'all. <laughs> By the time you go into bed, we're just getting up to skate, so. And it's just a beautiful thing that we don't want to go away because we are here. But the LA skate style has evolved so quickly, actually, that all the skate styles, that even mm -hmm. as a filmmaker from the outside, we were capturing what was happening in LA, and then we went into the edit room, and we came back three years later, and the moves were had changed. Now, now not only are they holding hands in circles, but they're flipping some of them upside down with their heads, you know, this high from the ground and their feet in the air, and they're they're doing tricks that they weren't even. And we're like, what? Oh, we could have filmed that, but the film is over. But but that's how quickly. <laughs> It's evolving, the styles are evolving. What city is, I'm, I'm going to assume that LA style is your favorite. Of course. Of course. <laughs> what, what city is your second favorite and why? I like, um, I like the fast backwards, the Philly fast backwards where there, that line of people and they were going backwards. I like that one. Um, to slide, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting 50, so I try to limit my sliding because stuff don't heal right. You're, you're quite a good slow walker, too, I will say. I can slow walk, but you know. <laughs> I'm, you know, I like to slow walk, but the Philly Fast Backward is fun because that's when we're playing the old school hip hop, set it off, move, and all those right, right. songs come into play. So those are the real fun songs. But the slow walk is real fun, it's sexy, it's cute. But that Fast Backward come in, honey, we getting it in. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were mentioning um, backstage that your life right now is so different than it was even two years ago when you were filming. And um, you've just been through a lot um, in those two years. And I was wondering, and you were saying that you, you were actually happy to share that story, which isn't even on, the fil on film, because you felt like it could help a lot of people who've, who've been struggling. So I wanted to you know, if you, you know how much you felt comfortable sharing with the audience of where you were two years ago, and then what's happening for you now that you know, we're you're not seeing on the screen what's happening for you now. Well, two years ago, I lost everything. Um, I'm, I do property management. That's my nine to five. I'm still, I'm still back in it now. Um, but I lost everything. I lost my job for political reasons, and because I live where I work, um, it's very rare unless you're deciding to leave on your own in property management that you just jump to the next job. So me and my kids were in a shelter for like three months. Um, but because I did not want to be defeated, I was turning 45 that year, and I, and I still had a birthday party at the Sofitel Hotel in Beverly Hills, honey, because I was just not going to allow my situation to defeat me. And a lot of the women in the shelter, I would go out and do my job searches and all that, and they're like, yo, if you want to talk to you, where you been all day? I'm like, I don't work here. I'm one of you. But it was that drive they saw in me that I was not going to allow it to defeat me. And then around that same time, my son Shannon, he was diagnosed with HIV. So it was a lot going on at that time. And so just my faith in God and, and just what, knowing that I just can't stay here. 
because I got five kids depending on me. So um, he was asking me backstage, you know, do you mind sharing? I don't mind sharing. My life is an open book because I feel like if my story can help anybody to say, I'm going through all this, I can't make it. Hey, I've been suicidal. I've been there. And um, being coming from being 15, I was out the, kicked out of the house at 15 on my own. Finished high school on time at Dorsey High School. Went to college in Atlanta. Got pregnant, came home. And I still do what I have to do. Five kids later and now three grandchildren later. So life is what you make it. And if anybody out there is going through, because suicide is, has just become this topic lately. Trust me, you're looking at someone who's been through hell and back. And if I can make it with five kids by five different men, I'm telling y'all all my business. <laughs> because people feel like, you know, I'm just this nasty, awful person because I've done all these things. But I got five beautiful children who are alive and well and three beautiful grandchildren and I'm still here. And now I have HBO, the world, millions of people are gonna see me on Monday night, me and my family. <laughs> and we're also in this month's issue, the February issue of Vanity Fair. <laughs> so if I don't make you feel better, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> So how do you, as the director, protect, because I'm assuming that you develop you know, a lot of feelings for the people that you're following, so how do you decide what you're going to film and what you're going to put in the film, and then you, know, you, want, you want to capture like, the best story possible, but you also want to be protective of the people that you've developed these relationships with. So how do you navigate that filmmaker, you know, this is an amazing story, and then, but as a human being, you're like, but I want to be protective of, of these people. How do you yeah. navigate that? It's a beautiful question. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there is a, a beautiful trust that's created between a documentary filmmaker and the people within the film. Because on one hand, they have to trust us to, to be filming all the time and, and to know what to put and what not to put into the film. And also we have to trust them to be willing to sacrifice all the years and hours of our life to tell this story and put ourselves aside, you know, to lift them and make this film um, oftentimes for nothing, for no financial. And, and um, so, you know, we had that bond and there was a lot of things that were filmed, you know, also with Reggie and Nadira. I filmed, I was filming them at one point and they got into this explosive argument and I was right there with the camera and at, at some point I thought, did they know that I'm here? Because I, like they were just screaming at each other and I was right there and I didn't know, do I back away? And, and you know, because I was up in their business and living with 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 them and and um, I think that it, that's where the trust comes that, you know, yes, Felicia was homeless for a while and you know yes Shannon is going through a whole lot more than we showed in the film and yes the kids were with five different dads but um you know f for me it wasn't about sh showing everything I wanted I was also very protective at at the time that that they were um you know in a in a shelter I was living in New York City in a uh, not even one bedroom apartment and I was like you can come here if you want but I'm, I'm across the country I felt very hope you know um hopeless in that sense where I, I couldn't do more um but I I mean I, I guess it's just it's just a trust that you that you have to to know what is safe to put in front of an audience and what should be protected we are very protective of them um in the skate community we're all very tight we argue we fuss like any other family but <laughs> when outsiders come and we really like I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but we've grown to love them, so they're one of us. Like, they're, they're, there's no way of getting to her without going through us or Tina, because we just have this bond, this beautiful bond now, even in our own regular families. Her mom and dad, I call them mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's a beautiful relationship that is gained if you have a good documentary filmmaker. Thank you. Then this next question, I, I didn't even know how to, how to phrase it as a question, so I'm just gonna make the observation and, and you can just say whatever. In the film, when um, Felicia and her family go and they're paying to get into the rink, and it comes up on the register, 
Thursday nig. Oh, oh, it's for Thursday night. I knew I, I knew yeah. it's Thursday night, uh, but I'm. I didn't either. <laughs> but I'm watching that. I'm thinking, this could be programmed so that Thursday could be abbreviated and night could be. You know what I mean? Mm. To, to to do this is mm. not subtle, mm. and it's really offensive. But you didn't notice it. So next wow, question. Wow, no, that's that's. <laughs> but I just thought that you know, was good. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was like, that's a not very subtle, yeah. you know, way to tell these people who are coming mm. to spend money with you how you feel about them. Mm -hmm. You know, which, as black people, you know, that's not an unfamiliar situation for us. Well, yeah. um, I'm going to ask you a really unfair question since you're a filmmaker and you're not a policy analyst or anything, but spending five, almost six years making this film and, and seeing all the political situations around it, do you, can you think of any way, any conversation, any ideas that could be used to sway politicians or people in power to push beyond... Um, the dollars and cents and to see the greater value that is, you know, achieved by serving a community um, in the way that these rinks do. Has, has anything sort of sparked in your head a, an argument or arguments that could possibly be used to sway this, this tide that is paving over? Yes, guilt. I, th I think, you know, uh, the, one of the backbones of what the themes that we were trying to bring out in this film is community versus... Uh, the dollar sign, like what value of a community versus value of money, and and money keeps winning. It's winning in politics. It's winning everywhere you look. And uh, if we don't get that money out of so many areas of our country, it, we're going down fast. And you know, in terms of community spaces, our whole country is going to look like the ten, the same ten big box stores if we don't do something soon. And so. That is part of what we tried to show in this film. And I think, um, you know, on one hand, arming the community with knowledge is helpful because although that's not uh, the politicians themselves, when the people know what to fight for, they can they they have a better chance at winning. And so um, we do have one victory story, which is that since the making of this film, we realized how cities are using zoning as a way to push these communities out. And we started... so. Um, skaters are constantly reaching out to us and saying, our rink is closing, what do we do? And our answer is always, well, we're filmmakers, we don't know, but um, you know, many of the films, that, uh, films, many of the rinks that we shot in, in the making of this film are gone already. Um, and so um, later in the process, as we started realizing that they were using zoning across the board in whatever city we were in, that was the one through line that was always there is that every rink turned into a big box store and, and was rezoned. So um, Baltimore was losing their rink. I think you saw it um, in this section of the film when they were all having their protests. And it said um, that their zoning was still pending. They fought because they knew what to ask for and they won. And they, they got to keep it zoned for a community space and they got their rink back. So I do think part of it is knowing what to ask for. Yeah, thanks Baltimore to Deanna. Deserves a round of applause. Thanks to Deanna and Tina, they mm. educated them on how to get it. So she left that part out. Thank you, United States. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, me. <laughs> but but uh, you know, so I, yeah, I think politicians, to some extent, have to keep their voters happy. And if we're making the right demands, then maybe we can start to protect some of the spaces. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is in the last two or three years, there've been uh, countless articles. To documenting the fact that all these major cities in America are just like losing the black population at a rapid rate. I mean, in Los Angeles, black folks are just, <laughs> man. Um, and one of the things I love about this film is it really, it really illustrates on the human level what is lost. And it's not just, you know, the black communities that are, you know, that suffer because of this, but it's the fabric of the city, period. It's something of the texture of the city, mm -hmm. something of the, you know, fabric of the city um, is lost, you know? Um, and I just wanted to know, you know, you just sort of chime in, either one of you, on, on the ways in which this film really speaks to much, much larger political and social issues um, that are happening, but in especially with regards to African-American communities. One thing country. I think, um, Namala Deanna really touched this more than me, but people read. 
Um, we're just voting for anybody and not doing the background and really reading what you're voting for or not voting at all. Um, the president thing, you don't really have control of. But when it comes to your local um, politicians and all that, you do have power. Really read what you're voting about and really get out there because those things mean, and if you don't know, ask. It's that simple. And don't keep people in place just because they've been there a long time. Sometimes it's time to go because the tide, the weather has changed. Um, and that's what's killing a lot of it because no one's reading. Don't go off what's on the news. Read it yourself. Read those propositions. Find out the background behind all that stuff because all that matters with the rezoning and with everything else. Folks just don't like to read and don't like and they're lazy. I'll just I'll see what CNN say. No, see what this says in black and white, so you know what your rights are and how you're protecting whatever whatever you're looking to make sure was right. Because we're not we're not finding out for ourselves. We're depl we're depending on television and not just finding out like, the real deal. And that's why we keep having the same problems over and over with the same politicians in a place that should be gone, been gone years ago. So that's just my kind of cap on it, but she'll go deeper into her, to everything else. Yeah, I, I'd say I, I, that. I was just gonna say, I think that we all need to constantly question ourselves and our actions and our assumptions. And even if we think that we are not racist or we are not looking at a situation through a certain lens, to keep asking. It was something that I did in the entire making of this film every day. I, I had to re-ask what lens I'm telling this film through. And and I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear that still exists in this country. Uh, and I hope, I tried to make a film that could dispel that just a little bit because every time Tina and I went to one of these rinks, we felt our privilege immediately because the cops would ask us, why are you here? You know, you shouldn't be here. It's not safe. And and I would constantly turn that around and say, well, why don't you think it's safe? And, you know, we, we were going with our family and our friends and none of them were being asked or stopped. And you know, there, there's a shot, one of my favorite shots in the film when Felicia and her kids are going into the rink uh, the last night at Skate Depot and there's all those cops that there's this shot of this dad with ki a kid on his shoulders and then just to the side of him is this sheriff with all his guns and you know, to take his kids to roller skate. And there's so much fear. And you know, the rink owners that we talk to, why don't you want to have an adult night? Why do you have these rules? It's always these... these um, these stereotypes and and if you if you go back to you know fake news isn't new fake news has been around forever and fake news during the civil rights era was telling white people to be scared of black people because there's diseases in swimming pools or because they shouldn't dance together because the, the violence and you know one of the one of the things that we learned is that when they were segregating these nights um, when a, a black skater would try and go on a family night or a top 40s night or whatever the white night was, um, they would be told they didn't have their size skates. And then if they could get in, they would have the rinks would hire thugs to actually hurt them, trip them, beat them up and make them leave. And if they pushed back and said, you know, I have a right to be here too, the rink owners would go, see, when there's black people here, there's violence, even though it was being acted upon them. And so these stereotypes have been perpetuated for so long that it's a really hard thing to break. And, and so, you know, trying to do my little piece to say, what are you afraid of? This is, this is, these are beautiful people with a, a, a world of celebration and family and love. And that was always what we tried to keep at the heart of the film that despite, in spite of the police and the, the, all the issues that are they're being that they're facing across the board, they still created this place of love and safety and unity and and so I hope that you all felt that and aren't scared to go. Those of you that aren't African American in the audience, I can't see, aren't scared to go to one of these nights and and enjoy alongside them because they are so welcoming of of all of us and and welcome Tina and I into their world with open arms. We became part of their family, so. Yeah, I hope that that answers yes, your question. Yes, white people skate. Yes, white people skate with us. Yes. Why, as a matter of fact, Tim is a Ralph Lauren model who is still gorgeous. He's a skater with us. We have Nelson, the, just the Spanish gentleman you saw doing the beautiful spin in the middle. 
So don't ever feel like, oh, are they gonna welcome me? Can you skate? That's all we care about. If you can't, go towards the middle. <laughs> That's all. Let's save me and you. <laughs> so before we open up for the um, for the Q and A, I wanted to um, ask about two scenes in the film. There, I mean, there there were so many moments in the film that were incredibly beautiful and movement moving. Um, I wanted to ask about. Um, I wanted to get his name right in Chicago. Calvin. Calvin. And your choice to, when he's doing those spins, 28 spins he did, and your choice to do it in slow motion um, to sort of like really capture, why, why that choice? We, we knew that um, it was important in the making of this film not just to show what's happening right now, but to go back and to show why these spaces have so much meaning. Um, and so one of the ways was to, to show neutral territory in the rinks in LA. Another was to show you know, early hip hop and rap artists and how they got started. And then the, the third was to show um, you know, the, 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 those that fought and paved the way for this to be what it is. And um, so Chicago and St. Louis both have packed rinks for the senior sessions every day, that every time that they have a senior session is packed, like packed the way that here it is for a younger session. And that's rare, it's not like that in every city. And so we couldn't afford to go to both, but we went to Chicago and we knew that we wanted to get these legends that you know had these great stories about you know how hard they fought for what they have and they, they just have so much pride while they're there. And so um, you know we shot some, some stuff off frame rate, slow motion, some stuff regular but um you know even the music that we used in that scene we used like a scratching sound of records to kind of bring you back and 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 take and and slow you down so i think you know artistically that was where we were going with it and the the other scene that was just like really beautiful and heartbreaking is when the young man is on the rink by himself and he says i can't take them off it's the last night yeah yeah you know with um, the lights literally turned off on him. Right, yeah. right. And just, you know, um, for you to be there and capture that, what was that? They had locked the doors already, and this kid wouldn't stop skating. And and he he was yelling at them, like, I'm not leaving. And, you know, we were filming the, the close-ups of them turning off the lights and, and then they turn them back on for us because it is a movie, and so we'd say, get that again. And, you know, we were, we were getting the... the, the the impact of the end of the night. And at some point they were like, dude, you gotta get off the floor. And so so um, that was when we said, hey, you know, um, we're just gonna film him till they kick him out. We saw what was happening. So we just set our cameras there and they turned the lights off on him. But It was an incredibly <laughs> heartbreaking and, and, and beautiful moment. So we're going to um, take some questions now. The only, just a few, make sure that your question is a question and be respectful of everyone else in the audience. And although I'm sure your monologues are lovely, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if you could ask questions, that would be really great. There's one in the front. Oh, are there microphones? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Citlali Gonzalez. Um, I'm writing a research paper using United States as my primary source. Wow. Awesome. Um, and recently I was speaking with one of my skate friends who's been way in the skate game for a lot longer than I have. And I asked, how do you feel about being part of this like rich culture? And he basically said to me, it doesn't matter. Like in a couple years, this isn't, no one's going to know about this. It's going to die off. It's dying now. Okay. So in terms of preservation, I mean, this entire film was, Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, it's such a clear demonstration of why it needs to be preserved. So other than instilling adult nights, what can be done for the, from the community to preserve skate rinks? To go. It's that to simple. Go. You have to support it for it to stay open. It cannot run itself. The, the money you spend to get in the rink, we need to keep the lights on. We need to pay the DJ and the people, the staff, the snack bars. So you're not hungry. And so, I mean, it's simple as that. It's to go. Go skating. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be the greatest skater. Just go. I was in Atlanta um, two, nights, two nights ago, um, and uh, I met a, 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 a two female skaters who's just started uh, a, a 
I don't think it's a company, but an organization called Each One Teach One. And their goal is to start teaching younger skaters to bring them into this world. There are many skaters who will go to a kid's session and just kill it on the floor so that they can see what they could as aspire to be. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, to, they're not going to stay alive unless skating comes back. And so one of our hopes is that people see this film and, and, want to go skating again um, but those that don't also that they can maybe if they're passionate enough join us as a think tank of what we can do and that's where we, we came up with the idea of, of uh, Buddy's Rink becoming a not-for-profit to see if we can kind of repurpose roller rinks and think about them to you, know, you go in these rinks now and they have this dingy old carpet and it looks like it's straight out of the 70s and like, there's nothing revitalized about the spaces yet so I think there's room for that if people want it. I was curious if the owners of the Glendale Roller Rink know they're going to be in your movie. <laughs> no. Yikes. <laughs> uh, oh, well. We, you know on Monday. <laughs> we shot that uh, scene with spy cameras. We bought them off of a Chinese website, and they, ha they had glass glasses with cameras in them and a pen with a camera in it, and um, we had mic'd them up, and the you know, their love, love mic, so the other half of it was in our bag, and we were pretending to not notice them, and, um, yeah, so, um, we did, we, we hired a lawyer, <laughs> and, and, um, it, apparently the law states that if you are in a public space where, it doesn't have to be publicly, like, it can be privately owned, but if the public is in the space, there's many people around, if it's a park, if it's wherever, um, and something happens, and you filmed it, and you get out with your gear, then it's yours. But if if anyone makes an indication, like come come over here, you know, come in this back room, I want to talk to you privately, then you immediately can't film it. But as long as they're out in the open, as was done in this film, and everyone could see it, um, and we made it out with our gear, um, we can use it. So. <laughs> I think there was a question in the in the back. All the way, all the way up. All the way up. Yeah, the mic's coming. That was absolutely beautiful, and thank you so much for making that. I adored the structure. I loved like this weaving of the beautiful skating that picked you up, and then dealing with some really poignant and um, important topics. And so I wanted to know a little bit about that. How did you come that structure? How long did that take you? And what was that process for you? I think that was the hardest part about making the film. Um, we had 500 hours that we whittled down to these 89 minutes. Um, and a lot of beautiful footage, a lot of great scenes, and and complete like other characters that we followed didn't make it into the final cut um, but it took a lot of trial and error I, I I'm a screenwriter as well and so I wrote it like a screenplay and I made sure that it had you know the act one to act two break it had um, the, like the the, the midpoint, it had, the, they always say to have like the highest high and then drop you down to the lowest low. So I made sure that the, you know, um, IR with all the skate styles coming together and Batman going through everyone's legs was like the high and then Buddy announces it's closing and I make you cry, hopefully. And so it, it was actually, it, you know, it wasn't all actually in that order, but I, I, I structured it like a, like a narrative film. So hopefully. Uh, Do you think there would be any, anywhere, any place that some of that, bonus footage. I mean, when DVDs used to be a thing, you know, <laughs> there'd be an extra disc of bonus footage. Do, is there a, a way that some of that extra footage? <laughs> um, to be honest, if somebody wants to pay us to, to dig through that arc, that Amen. footage, sure, but I am burnt out on working for free. <laughs> but we yeah. have it. We, you know, we, we actually have hilarious footage of spills, of falls. Of, of in, in L.A., the wheels are super slippery, and so if someone falls here, you can't stop quickly so the next one piles the next one piles and we have like a pile up of human bodies and it just like a lot of also the footage you're um, gonna scare them Deanna <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the footage also um you know was me and Tina behind the camera and they would slide straight into us and take us out and so if we if we 
um, had kept the, the footage going any longer, the camera would have like toppled and gone sideways. <laughs> and so, you know, we just edited it so that you didn't know those parts existed, but. <laughs> We'll get, we'll get to you. Are there two mics? You could get one to be ready next. I thought the footage was just wonderful, and I was wondering how the skating footage was done. Was somebody actually skating with a camera? Um, yeah, so uh, it was very challenging to shoot this film uh, be for many reasons, but uh, primarily because it's a roller rink, so that's really low lit. Um, they're moving really quickly, and they have dark skin tones. So it was three... Um, challenges all at the same time um, and also all the skate styles require different types of shooting so some of them it's about speed on the outside others it's about the intricacies of what they're doing with their wheels and so um, it was no one's really done this before so we had a lot of of trial and error. Um, we handed our camera off to skaters and taught them how to shoot for us for the fast stuff and, and we teach them how to skate even trade yeah, they taught us how to skate. We taught them how to shoot. Um, and one of the stories I always tell, it's quite funny, is that um, I gave a skater the camera, and I said, okay, the camera's set. Everything is ready to go. All you need to do is hit record and stay exactly four feet from the skater in front of you. If you get any closer, it'll be out of focus. If you get any further, it'll be out of focus. But if you stay exactly the same speed as them and track them, um, you don't have to do anything else. You just have to point and, and get the shot. And so, um, go. And then they would uh, chase you know, the skate around and get this person. They brought it back, and I'd look at the footage and go, OK, so you only got their face the whole time. Uh, we want to see their skates too. Can, can you try again? Okay, okay. So they would go out and they'd shoot and they'd come back and we'd watch it. Okay, so you only got their feet the whole time. So, so then it was training. So we'd say, can you try five seconds on their feet, five seconds on their face, five seconds on... And, and so there's a lot of... Um, of learn and Felicia pushed me from behind skating while I was shooting. I mean, we... She we, can still walk, can't she? She's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we also rented a... Um, a golf cart once um, with lights, and we used a red camera for all the like beautiful slow motion shots. And when we had the rink to ourselves, uh, so many different tricks. My name is Lewis, and I'm a skater. Um, hey. You kind of asked my question uh, before the last one, but um, I've been skating at World on Wheels my whole life, and um, I'm so glad it's reopened. And my question was going to be. Uh, this is by far the most comprehensive documentation and most cinematic um, footage of skating I've ever seen. And as someone who's almost 40 and has been skating his whole life, I've been waiting for that my whole life to see that. And so congratulations on finally putting something on film that looks so beautiful. So my question is, what can I do to help get all that extra footage on YouTube, <laughs> Vimeo, Instagram? <laughs> Because I want to see it, it's specifically Los Angeles. <laughs> um, you can talk to me after. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, there's, there's one here, and then there's one up there. Hello, um, I kind of have a two-part question. So the first time I saw United Skates was um, during Soul Skate in Detroit ah. earlier this year. Yeah, and that was amazing to see it with a crowd full of skaters. Um, so question Scariest one. Scariest moment of my life. <laughs> 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 Everyone loved it. It was beautiful. Um, so question one is, since that time, or really since you started touring, showing it, um, what, what have you noticed has changed in the skate community and how they've reached out to you? And, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the second part. I'll start with that. You can think okay, of that other cool. one. Um, so... We, as I said, we've been in 125 film festivals, um, and uh, we've won a lot of audience awards, which I thought was pretty cool because we would win them in like um, Chicago Film Festival. We won it in New Orleans, which were predominantly African American, and then we were at Twin Cities, Minnesota, and uh, Vancouver, Canada. We were all white. Vancouver was all white and and elderly, and we won the audience award there too. So clearly, um, one well, thing that them, right. What the, <laughs> one thing we've been learning is that it's it's touching people um, across the board, which is nice. Um, in terms of the skaters, um, it's been a mixed bag. There have been the skaters, like this gentleman here, that are incredibly grateful, and it's more about um, uplifting the community as a whole. Reggie from the film, he's, he's very good at analogies, and he said, 
this film is like the oxygen mask in a in, a, in an airplane. He's like, it drops, and then first you got to put on yourself, and then you can put on your kids. So if you weren't represented yet in the film, if your city wasn't enough in the film, just see this as the oxygen mask to keep us going, and then we'll get to you. Um, but there are many skaters who are also frustrated, frustrated that we didn't highlight their cities, their styles, them personally. Um, we get a lot of angry emails to this day. Why isn't Detroit in the film more? Why isn't St. Louis in the film more? And and uh, you know, ninety minutes, people. Yeah. So minutes. so make mixed bag on the skate front. <laughs> what was what were some of the deciding factors? I mean, out of five hundred hours of footage, what were some of the deciding factors that for you to say, you know, Detroit makes the cut, um, L.A. makes the cut, Chicago makes the cut? What were the deciding deciding factors and? you know, which cities would be. That goes back to the question about structuring. The, the film, you know, um, one of the hardest scenes to cut was roll call. Um, and we recut that so many times. And originally I was hoping that roll call could be a lot longer and each city could have its moment where like if you were in Baltimore, we have a lot of interviews with people from Baltimore talking about the music coming out of Baltimore and, and we wanted to use that music and we had gotten skate uh, producers from a lot of these cities to use their original music, talk about what they do, where snapping comes from, and then go to Detroit and do the same, and how it came out of Motown. Like th this is this movie is the tip of the iceberg of what this world is, um, and we just cut it and cut it and cut it, and it was always too long and it never worked. And ultimately, we had to make the brutal decision to cut out everybody who talked about their cities to cut out all their music and to use just one song that played through it all with a title card that said the name of their city and like that just killed me to do, have to do but for the betterment of the movie you could feel that it's what it needed so um ultimately the only cities that get a longer shout out are the cities where our main characters lived so felicia got one in la um buddy got one in chicago and then because reggie doesn't have one he didn't Gallons. So that was how that happened. Any more questions? Hi. Um, it seems like it would take a lot of commitment to skate that well. How do the kids do it now? Because e even your kids, you know, they're, everybody's kids are playing with devices and everything. It's like if there's like not a lot of skating rinks, how, what type of. Um, how long does it take? How many hours, thousands of hours, does it take to skate that well? My kids get it in. <laughs> they, you have to go. It's just in practice. Um, and then you, when you have, when you're amongst the skate family, you learn from each other. You take a little bit of this from this person, a little bit from that person. And if you just keep going, you will get better. You're not going to get good in two sessions. You have to keep going. It has to be part of your culture for you to be there to get it. Am I right, young man? So you just have to keep going and, and be willing to learn. There's some people like Batman. He practices every single day. Every single day. I'm beyond that now because I'm 50. But he's young enough, you know what I mean? And the kids, and, and, the, and it leads me to something we don't. Something we talked about, Michelle Obama talked about, which was childhood obesity. And uh, the reason why we have childhood obesity is because we're buying these gadgets for the kids and they just sit here all day. Can I have some candy? Can I get some ice cream, Mom? Bring me some cookies. So they're sitting there all day, and they're doing this. But if they're skating, they're moving. They're moving. They're burning. And if you want to say, oh, what is skating going to do? Okay, it's fitness. Okay, you're, you're burning all those calories. It's, it's cardio. So it does have a purpose, but just with the music and a whole culture of beautiful people that if you just simply go, You'll come to learn and love. Like I, my skate family is closer to me than my regular family. It's like the weirdest thing. So it's just a, it's a real culture of people. But I will say that this film is the MBA of skating, and that you can oh, also yeah. just shoot hoops. You can go and skate and and not need to be a Batman that kicks a skate and catches it and puts it under his butt and goes through fifteen people. But you yeah. can like feel the music and let go and enjoy. You know, and I'm actually really jealous because. I hear these skaters saying that if this is their church, that they go in there and when they walk out four hours later, they have no problems anymore. They left it all in the wood. It's and our sanctuary. I don't have anything like that. Most of us don't have anything like that. And so, you know, even to just go and to, I think if you get to a certain level where you can skate enough to stop being 
nervous and scared and you can just let go, then 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 you get the benefits. You don't you know need to be in the NBA. <laughs> and I think the film really illustrated that beautifully through Shannon. You know, when when um, he wasn't able to skate anymore and it seemed that that was sort of the snow with the what started the snowball effect of things mm -hmm. sort of falling apart for him. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, so the emotional well-being and the psychological well-being, mm -hmm. you know, as well as you know the fitness, but just what it does um, for your internal life as oh, well. It's it's such a sanctuary. I, I can't tell you. I could walk into the ring mad as hell about my day or what's going on in my life, but I promise you, on my grandkids, when I leave there, I am like. Okay, now why was I upset? Why was I so mad? Because we, we call it leave it on the wood. And we leave it right there. Church, you leave it at the altar, right? Well, for skaters, we leave it on the wood. We leave it right there. And we going on with our lives the next day. So you just have to have something that allows you to be free. And skating is a, a sense of freedom for us. Like some people, you see they're in their own world. You, they don't see, like for me, when, when, that, when I'm in that zone, there is nobody on that floor but me in my head. But there's about 500 people around me. But in my mind, it's only me. And if you can find that sense of sanctuary in anything you do, man, that's living. I think that's a great place to, to end. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't hear that. What?